Okay. Better? Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. Okay. So today um, I'm going to talk about our work on using semantic integration technologies across species for rare disease diagnostics. And um, one of the one of the nice things about this particular body of work is that it really demonstrates a practical usage of ontologies. And ontologies, you know, are often utilized to structure knowledge or or philosophical explorations, but more and more we're starting to see how they can be applied in various kinds of ways um, in order to help uh, clinical and translational uh, research applications, and in this case, um, diagnostics. So the promise of precision medicine tells us that we should be able to take all the attributes of a given person um, and then collect all those attributes for each person in, in whatever cohort and then be able to classify those patients uh, into um, meaningful ways that help us understand what their diagnosis is, what their prognosis is, what their treatment regime should be. Um, and we can use many different kinds of characteristics in order to, to think about this. Um, and increasingly, um, in um, the current world, these can include lots of e-health applications, real-time data, social um, network data, all kinds of things that we didn't necessarily even uh, traditionally think about um, really uh, being reflective of our health. So we need to build systems that can grow to accommodate um, how to meaningful how to sift through all of these data and meaningfully classify patients. It's not enough to just say that we can classify patients. We actually need to find the useful classifications that help us understand, you know, how, how to answer important clinical questions for those patients. But in order to do that, we also need to leverage all the biological knowledge about the relationships between these types of things. So our, our fundamental dogma is such that we have our individual genetic endowment, uh, we are exposed to our environment over time. We have different behaviors. Um, and that results in a phenotypic spectrum that also changes over time for the life of an organism. But there are many kinds of relationships between all of these three types of entities. Um, you know, changes in um, genetic variation over time in a tumor um, can be responsive to an environment, can lead to changes in histological phenotypic outcomes. And so it's a dynamic representation between um, these three fundamental components. So when we think about um, diagnostics um, for Mendelian and especially rare Mendelian diseases, the prevailing clinical pipelines leverage really only a tiny fraction of those data that we were just talking about. Um, let's see, I do have a pointer. Um, I don't know, does it work if I do it here? It does, look at that. Um, uh, so if we think about, you know, what, what happens in the average clinic is you might go in and have your exome or genome sequenced, um, and they would have a bunch of candidate diseases, and they would compare that, that whole exome against um, a genomic reference range, which for the most part, if you're of white European descent, you're probably pretty lucky that your variant might be in that collection, and if you're not, you're probably less likely, although that is rapidly changing, fortunately. Um, but there's a lot of other kinds of data that we aren't using effectively to classify that information. Clinical phenotypes, which is the main focus of this talk, but many other types of, of information about the patient, such as um, various kinds of um, omics technologies, um, socioeconomic factors, environmental exposure data, um, both from you know, personal devices as well as sort of um, environmental monitoring. And the reference population level cohorts that we might um, be able to compare um, against for these types of, of data. And so we really, um, really have a loss of discriminatory power when faced with a diagnostic pipeline that might result in 5,000 candidate variants for a given patient. And that is way too many for a clinician to be able to sift through um, throughout the literature in order to be able to determine what is the cause of that patient's um, rare genetic disease. So the talk that I'm going to give is about how do we actually um, utilize phenotypic information to improve the, the, the picture here. So right now, um, let's see, um, oops. Um, so right now we have about um, 10 to 25% diagnostic rate 
um, for rare disease patients that walk into a, cl a, a clinic um, who have a rare genetic disease. So we can definitely um, improve uh, upon that. And of course, that in and of itself is already a success story. So I want to talk first about the human phenotype ontology. Um, and so, you know, how many of you are actually familiar with, I mean, I'm at the, you know, center, epicenter of, of uh, there aren't too many epicenters of ontologies, and this is one of them. So I'm sure that some of you are, are familiar with ontologies. How many of you are familiar with ontologies? So do I need to give an introduction to ontologies? I do? Okay. Okay, great. Okay, great. So um, an ontology um, is a structured terminology um, where each term um, is in a graph structure, as you can see here. So here we have this term hyposmia. Um, in, here in the human phenotype ontology, which is an ontology that represents abnormal human phenotypic features or symptoms, um, these terms can have multiple parents. So you can see um, there can be multiple ways to get up to the root of the terminology. And as you go down in the graph, you get to more specific terms. Um, and the terms themselves, such as hyposmia, are defined logically um, using an, a language called the web ontology language, or OWL, uh, or OWL2 for short. And you might say, OK, that acronym doesn't add up, Melissa. And that's exactly right, because ontologists are nerdy and they like OWLs. So, um, so hyposmia is def <laughs> um, so hyposmia, this term, um, is actually defined in terms of other terms from other ontologies in a logical fashion that a software tool called a reasoner can actually leverage. So that software tool um, can, can know that, for example, deeply set eyes are a subtype of abnormality of the globe location, which is a subtype of abnormal eye morphology. And so if I query on all phenotypes that um, have to do with abnormal eye morphology, I'm going to come back with terms that uh, uh, are annotated to, you know, data that's annotated to deeply set eyes. Furthermore, um, these terms, such as hyposmia over here, are defined in terms of the logic with other terminology. So here, um, the gene ontology, it's not really working very well, is it? Um, the gene ontology uh, uh, term sensory perception of smell. So hyposmia is an abnormality in the sensory perception of smell. And the really cool thing about this underlying logic is that it's built in data integration. So this term in the gene ontology has been annotated to 34,000 34, times um, to a variety of different genes in 22 different species. So there's a lot of data out there about the gene function, sensory perception of smell, and if hyposmia is an abnormality in the sensory perception of smell, well, all of a sudden there's a lot of uh, genes that we might be able to associate that information with. And so the HPO um, has over 14,000 terms in it right now, and it's basically used to provide that terminology content for representing computational models of disease. And so what that looks like is we say for every known uh, Mendelian disease, um, we can create a phenotypic profile. And so this just shows how we can, as you go down in the phenotype graph, so here abnormality of the orbital region um, has 2,600 diseases associated with it, but abnormality of the globe location has only 1,000 uh, diseases associated, whereas hypertelorism um, has 94 diseases associated with it. And so you can see that basically each disease um, the more specific the phenotypic term, the less diseases that it would be associated with. Um, and each disease has a set of phenotypic features that are associated with it, um, creating a, a computational model of disease. And that's a simplistic um, description of the model, but uh, you get the idea. So this is what this actually looks like in practice. And this is a, a real case um, where uh, two patients, um, one on the left, a three-year-old girl and a 14-year-old boy over there on the right, both came into the same clinic within two weeks of each other. Um, and the clinician did not recognize either of the two patients as having Weidemann Steiner syndrome. And the patients themselves had, um, you know, slightly different uh, phenotypic features than would be expected for Weidemann Steiner syndrome. And in fact, some of those features are actually um, the opposite. So over here on the right, the 14-year-old boy has a long has long toes, and you you'll also note that here these are these human phenotype ontology terms. These terms 
are not things that you would have an ICD code for in your clinical system. Doctors don't um, diet, you know, um, have uh, terms for things like long toes so much. So these are like characteristics of the organism that are helping us build systems that help diagnose the patient. But they're not something that you can bill for necessarily. There's no procedure associated with having a long toe. You just have a long toe. So there's a lot of content like that in the HPO that's simply not in standard clinical terminologies because they're really, it's really treating the human patient as an organism and providing descriptors for how we describe features of organisms. Um, and I'll get to why that's really important uh, in a bit. And so in this case, we have a uh, phenotype, long toe, which is actually the opposite phenotype of what we had curated in our gold standard um, phenotype profile for Weidemann Steiner syndrome. In some cases, there might be a missing phenotype. Short middle phalanx of the finger is not present in the 14-year-old boy, but a related phenotype is here in the girl. So cone-shaped epiphysis of the phalanges of the hand, you know, has a phenotypic similarity to the short uh, middle finger, phalanx of the finger. And so what this is, if I go back briefly, is it's saying there's related terms. These terms are not exactly the same, but they might be nearby in the graph, right? And so, so what the algorithm is gonna do is it's gonna try to find um, for a given profile, each for this, for this um, three-year-old girl and this 14-year-old boy, take their phenotypic profile, which the clinician has captured using HPO terms, and say, what is the disease that most closely resembles my patient's phenotypic features based upon what we call this fuzzy phenotype, phenotype matching algorithm that looks for the, the most similar set of nodes in that graph. So think about that HPO graph. It's like for every disease, we have a graph where there's a lit up set of nodes in that graph, which graph fits um, the best. And in this case, the clinician was quite surprised to find that within these within two weeks, both of these patients matched best to Weidemann Steiner syndrome, even though they had quite different phenotypes from both the gold standard and from each other. And it turns out that they have um, different variants in the same uh, in the same gene K, KMT2A. And so, you know, it also kind of gets after the fact. Well, does that mean it's the same disease or a different disease? That clearly have uh, different phenotypic features to some extent, but there's obviously a lot of uh, similarity, and that similarity is in fact what helped diagnose these two patients. Um, but we'll come back to this later. It, it's um, it's a challenge because the more um, we are able to classify patients as individuals, the more we tend towards every patient as their own disease. The question becomes, what are the useful classifications that help us? And so in this case, if we're going to uh, provide treatment to these two patients, um, that's the same or they have the same prognosis, and that might constitute keeping this as one single Weidemann Steiner syndrome. Or if not, we might make Weidemann Steiner syndrome one or A or whatever. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, the diagnostic efficiency for Mendelian diseases can be improved. Um, and so, oops, uh, so what other data can we use? So um, if you look at, um, Actually, I'm just going to skip to this one. So if you look at the human coding genome, um, there are 19,218 genes. Um, of those, roughly um, 3,900 of them have causal mutations that cause a phenotypic, out an abnormal phenotypic outcome. Do we really only know something about 18% of the human coding genome in terms of disease-causing genes for Mendelian disease. Um, if we take the orthologs of those um, 19,000 genes and we look at those orthologs in the five most commonly used model organisms, so fruit, fly, worms, yeast, mouse, and zebrafish, um, and we look at which of those genes do we actually know something about if we mutate those genes, what do, what do we know something about in terms of the phenotypic outcomes of those mutations? We end up with 15,000 uh, plus um, genes that have phenotypic features associated with them. And when you take the union of these two, you end up with 82% coverage of the human coding genome. So all of a sudden, we, we can have the capacity to leverage these model organism data to help support inference for the human coding genome. So remember, those clinicians got 5,000 genes to sort through when they are um, trying to figure out which disease their patient has, and that's too many. We need to get that number down 
um, so that they can more effectively evaluate um, uh, candidate genes. And so, um, so our hypothesis is that we should be able to use these model organism data in order to help improve um, the diagnostic efficiency of these types of, of, of whole exome and whole genome analysis. So other species aren't just relevant. Um, it's also important to know that it's not just those five model organisms. We actually need all the organisms. We need to learn um, about the phenotypic consequences of mutation in all the organisms because it helps us understand the biology. It's, it helps us find drug targets. It helps us understand the mechanism um, of, of these diseases. And so there are many wonderful examples. I also really just wanted to put an armadillo on the slide. So um, armadillos are actually a natural host of um, the leprosy uh, mycobacterium, that, uh, and it's the only other organism that, causes, that, that gets leprosy is, is the armadillo. Um, you probably already know that naked mole rats don't get cancer. Why is that? Um, uh, silkworms are a model for uric acid metabolism. Um, pond snails are models for inflammation-mediated memory dysfunction um, and show evidence of spontaneous neural tissue regeneration after injury. There's clearly a never-ending story about every organism. So how can we actually like, you know, tap into this, this, this biological diversity um, to help inform uh, disease diagnostics and mechanism discovery and drug discovery? Kind of an overall goal of our program, which I forgot to mention, it's called the Monarch Initiative for this work. So, but in order to do that, we need to actually help computers understand the phenotypic terms that we're using to describe these phenotypes. So here on the left, a clinician might use the term palmoplantar hyperkeratosis, and the computer really has no idea what that means. We actually have to tell the computer what does this term actually mean. We can place it in a graph, like we talked about earlier. Um, but we also have different communities that use different languages. So we want to relate the palmoplantar hyperkeratosis to a term that might be used by a mouse biologist where they might have a phenotype that's similar called uh, ulcerated pause. This is not a string matching problem. It's a conceptual alignment uh, problem. And then furthermore, the patient might refer to this particular phenotype as having thick hand skin. So even within the same species, we have different communities that use different terminological um, uh, uh, words to represent the same thing. Um, so you think it's bad that there's only a few of these problems, but the challenge is really that each data source uses their own terminology. Um, and I have to say, I've spent much of my career aligning other people's terminologies. <laughs> so a lot of a lot of what we'll talk about is is, is that process. But um, so here we have on, over there on the right, we have the human phenotype ontology. On the left, we have the mammalian phenotype ontology used by the mouse genome informatics um, uh, resource. But the, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of different terminological representations for each domain, each community. Um, and, and they're all represented differently. It's not just that they have a different term label for something, but the actual structure of the terminologies and how the information is encoded is actually different. So there's a computational alignment uh, challenge, and there's a whole field of research on ontology alignment in general to, um, you know, come up with better methods for aligning different conceptual representations. So I'm going to talk about the method that we've been using for this particular problem in the phenotype space, and this we call the chasm of semantic despair. Um, and this, this was <laughs> a term that was coined by Chris Shute, for those of you who know Chris, um, but made especially pretty by my um, uh, uh, favorite colleague, Julie McMurray, and yes, that is me at the bottom of the chasm of semantic despair. Um, and what, this, what the chasm of semantic despair is really talking about is, especially in the context of how do we relate clinical phenotypic features and encodings to basic science um, phenotypic information. Um, and whether it's, you know, proteomics or, or cellular models versus lab data or medical imaging, it doesn't really matter the point that these codings with the basic research community, pretty much whatsoever. At least in the basic research community, we have a bit more um, strategy and overlap in the terminological space, but um, really we have a, a terrible um, chasm of semantic despair but there between the basic and clinical side. And so that's part of what we're trying to address here as well. So the strategy that we have is to basically build in what we call logical decomposition. So palmoplantar hyperkeratosis is just a string to the computer. 
but we can represent it using species neutral terms from other ontologies. So if you recall from that human phenotype ontology, I talked about uh, rep representing um, terms using the gene ontology, but we can use many other different kinds of um, species neutral terms. So here, Pomo plantar hyperkeratosis is represented um, as an increase from the phenotype and trait ontology um, in the gene ontology term keratinization that's located in the Uberon um, stratum corneum layer of the skin that's part of the autopod. And you might say, okay, well, you know, clinicians don't use the word autopod. That's a sort of evolutionary biology term. But they don't need to know about all of this. All they need to do is use the term that has an identifier and the right um, uh, text definition. And the computer can tell us that, aha, uh, because the term definition logically um, for ulcerated pause actually matches the logical definition for palmoplantar hyperkeratosis, these two terms are similar to one another. Um, and we don't really say the words exact because they're in different species, so they're not really exact anyway. But again, it's a proxy for representing the specific phenotypes and this logical interoperability using species neutral um, ontologies and homologous concepts allows us to create this type of interoperability across species, in particular for phenotypes. So we've also recently um, been able to use this approach to prospectively harmonize um, phenotype terminology so that we can start getting more of those different species to participate and share their data in an interoperable way. Um, and so basically what this is, is it says, okay, the terms that have stars on them here, um, you know, are terms that have a pattern. So, you know, abnormality of organ function could be a pattern. And so anytime we have a subtype of function or a subtype of organ, we use that same pattern, right? Um, and so by aligning these patterns across the different terminologies, we can then create what we call the uber pheno ontology. We do like our umlauts um, in, uh, in the ontology community. So this, this terminology is the sort of consensus um, intersection of all those other um, phenotype terminologies that says these are the design patterns that match across all the different ones. And so this just shows you how you can do cross-species inference if you have um, information coming from uh, human and information coming from zebrafish, we can actually know that these terms are um, essentially implemented with the same design pattern um, and then automatically be able to um, infer relationships, for example, between gene function across those species and transfer across the species. So we also need um, sort of spatiotemporal representations to relate form, function, and dysfunction in order to interpret the genome for diagnostics or, or otherwise. And so this is, I just put this slide up on for the students to really think about the fact that no ontology really exists all by itself. It's all about the integration um, and the purpose that you want to have it serve. And so here we might have the gene ontology with respiratory gaseous exchange, which might relate to um, a gene, if that's a, a, a gene dysfunction, might be abnormal blood gas level, um, and these both relate to the anatomical term gas exchange organ and uberon, um, which, um, you know, we might have um, uh, in human and in fish, um, they would be uh, um, gills here in fish and lungs in human, but the evolutionary ancestor um, for lungs is actually the swim bladder, but it no longer has that same function. Um, and these relate to the cell types. Um, and the tissue types that um, are present at different spatial scales, um, and these are represented by the cell ontology. Um, and so, and then in also in the gene ontology, we have subcellular anatomy. So all these kinds of anatomical pieces in both uh, space and time fit together, and then also the other axis is, is function and dysfunction. So this is what this looks like when you put it all together. And um, so here we have, um, from, from a mouse, um, a term duplex kidney, which relates to a human disease phenotype, renal hypoplasia, where the, the intermediate uh, uber pheno term is abnormal kidney morphology. And so you can see that this term from this kind of uber phenotype ontology matches neither of the two terms from, that are used in those two organisms. And so there's some other examples here, abnormal palate morphology, here we have cleft palate, here we have high palate. Um, and this fuzzy matching 
Um, so now, as I showed you before, for the, the two patients with vitamin Steiner syndrome, is now also able to be used across species. So all of those genes that are annotated to all those phenotypes in the, in the Venn diagram slide that I showed um, are now accessible to this technology for comparison to use um, as uh, potential um, features that can help prioritize genes that come back in that list of 5,000 genes. Um, and so this is how you put it all together. So traditional um, variant filtering um, uses a variety of approaches. It looks for um, rarity of a variant. It looks for Mendelian inheritance patterns. Um, we look for, um, we use a variety of different pathogenicity algorithms. And these are always improving all the time. I um, mean, this is a fairly standard uh, approach. Um, but our special sauce is that over here on the phenotype side, we encode the patient's phenotypes using the HPO, and then taking data from a variety of sources, including human sources, such as um, OMIM and Orphanet and others, um, we can do that fuzzy matching and see if we can um, find a disease that matches based on that. Um, we, um, we match against um, the model organisms that I showed you earlier. And then we also do a guilt by association by bringing in data um, via orthology and via string DB um, which has a lot of protein-protein uh, interaction data. So if, if a phenotype is associated with a gene, um, but that gene's not on our short list, we might prioritize it if it um, has a protein-protein interaction with another gene that does have a similar phenotype. And so then together, these prioritized genes and their orthologs come together with the candidate variants that come out of the variant filtering, and we have a final prioritization um, scheme. And this tool is called... Um, uh, Eximizer and is developed by my colleague uh, Damien Smedley um, at Genomics England. So this is the story of Jessica. So this is one of our patients um, from Genomics England and it, um, uh, Jessica, um, and I just wanted to illustrate the power of how the ontologies are actually helping um, to improve the diagnostic rate at scale. So the Genomics England is one of the larger diagnostic programs in genetic diseases worldwide. Um, and here in the Jessica's case, she, um, at age four, uh, uh, was indicated with a rare condition um, with epilepsy. She had movement disorder, developmental delays, um, and her, her tests were negative. Um, uh, if you look over here on the left, we started with 6 million plus variants in her genome. Um, 677,000 of them were rare. 2,800 of them were predicted to cause a change in the protein. 67 of them were different to her parents, and using the phenotypic information and the protein-protein interaction information, we went from 67 to one candidate, which turned out to be the smoking gun, and this child is now being treated successfully with a ketogenic low-carb diet. So simply getting to that variant now is going to have this child live a healthy life. always makes me cry. Oh, um, the other thing it can do is it can, it can also help us identify new models. So as it turns out, we actually know a lot about genetic diseases that we don't know what the gene is still. Even still, there's lots and lots of gene, uh, diseases in OMIM for which we don't have the molecular basis. Um, and so we've actually recently um, used the same approach to actually find candidate genes for those diseases. Um, and so here's an example uh, using the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium data um, to find a candidate uh, disease gene for cataracts patients, um, CDKN2A. And so, um, and there's a, a link to the paper there if you want to read about that. And so we've actually identified a few hundred new disease genes using this, this same approach. So um, I want to talk a little bit about evidence, especially because I know we have a lot of students in the audience, and we were talking even at lunch about how, you know, um, how do we sort of uh, understand our assumptions about the data, and how do we include those assumptions in our investigative uh, bioinformatics applications. Um, and so I have two kinds of approaches that I want to talk about, one of which I want to talk about for two reasons. Um, one is what is a disease? What's the evidence that a disease exists? And how do we actually represent diseases? And it's also an example of, of ontology harmonization that takes years and years, but is um, critically important. And the other one is really about ways, to in, ways in which evidence might be used um, to help support um, conclusion drawing. So I'm going to start 
uh, with an overview of both. So um, over there on the left, we have um, a, an effort that we call the lumping and splitting group that's part of ClinGen. Um, and ClinGen is, uh, business is really about defining, um, you know, what, you know, what are, what are the disease gene relationships and what kinds of um, characteristics for these patients, um, you know, uh, um, are indicative of a given disease, um, when to define a new disease, when to merge diseases. Um, and so um, they've, we've been working with them to come up with guidelines, um, which are kind of summarized here. Um, you know, are there distinct molecular mechanisms? Are the, is there a reputable assertion of a difference between the two diseases? Um, is there a distinct clinical management um, uh, protocol for the two different diseases? And do they have different distinct phenotypic profiles? And so we developed an ontology called the SEPIO ontology, the Scientific um, Evidence um, and Provenance um, Information Ontology, which allows us, and I'm going to talk more about that in a second, to represent these these differences, these changes in these different um, in these different um, components, and then that information from the lumping and splitting group is used to help inform our Mondo ontology, which is an ontology that I haven't spoken about yet, which is basically um, an effort to try to take all the different global disease definitions for rare Mendelian diseases and bring them together into one harmonious ontology that helps support. Um, uh, uh, consensus definitions across the different resources. So um, if we have two different diseases that have the same label from two different resources, but one has a completely different genetic basis or a completely different treatment regime, how do we decide if that's the same disease or not? They have the same label. They might even cross-reference each other. But if they have different treatment regimes, you're a patient. You're going to get a different treatment if you're in one country or another. So we've got to figure out how to come up with consensus or else patients will not be um, treated with the same degree of, of rigor in the different contexts. And so we work with um, the ClinGen group to work back and forth and going through all the different diseases to try to define um, what these um, disease definitions really should look like. Um, so first I want to talk about the evidence part and then I'll talk about the Mondo part. So um, ev evaluate, so this is an example of how we might apply the SEPIO model um, to uh, the ability to evaluate the pathogenicity of a variant for a given condition. So here we might have three clinical labs that would interpret different types of evidence in determining whether a, a variant was pathological for a given disease. So uh, we might have computational prediction evidence. So the path, the um, maybe there is a truncation of the protein, or it's going to cause, um, you know, um, a malformation of the protein. Um, we have population frequency evidence. The variant is absent from population databases. Well, we know what the challenges are there, right? We, have, we are missing a lot of popula key populations. Um, we have family history evidence. The variant fails to segregate with disease phenotypes. We have functional evidence that the variant is shown to have um, normal activity uh, when put in, when in, in vivo. And so there's many different kinds of evidence, and there's a, an organization that has defined what types of evidence are important to decide when a variant is pathological for a given condition. But what we find when we look at the data is that the different labs will use different evidence lines and come up with different interpretations. So lab one here might say that I've got, um, yes, I have um, computational prediction evidence and population frequency evidence, but not the other two kinds, and then declare it to be pathogenic, whereas lab two might have the first type of evidence, but also family history evidence, and then um, lab three um, might have only um, functional evidence, and so it calls it, that lab calls it benign. And so what to do if you're a clinician saying, okay, well, there's only three labs that have evaluated this variant before the patient's sitting in front of me. Remember, I've gone from maybe 5,000 to 67, if I'm lucky, um, uh, candidate variants. How do I decide um, whether or not this is a, a candidate uh, for my patient? If, it's path if the um, different submitters from the different labs don't agree on whether it's pathogenic or not. And so um, SEPIO ontology helps support how we represent um, quantitative metrics of evidence quality, quantity, diversity, and concordance. I mean, I don't have time to go into all the details here, but basically we can make a graph structure of the different types of evidence. So here in the middle, we might have um, uh, co-immunoprecipitation evidence, 
Here we might have functional complementation evidence. Here we might have different types of imaging evidence, such as microscopy or co-localization. And so over there on the left, um, every time I go up there, I get the thing. Um, you know, one claim might be that I've, I'm pathogenic and I've got evidence of type 1 and type 2. And over there on the right, I'm saying that the variant is benign for that condition. And I've got evidence types uh, 3, 4, and 5 in green. And so it allows you to sort of create automated systems that can come up with, instead of just likely pathogenic or pathogenic, where we have a, a five-bucket system, we can actually have um, a gradient between zero and one of what does the evidence actually tell us by looking at degree of quality, quantity, diversity, and concordance. So here, for example, I've got lots of imaging evidence that says that it's benign, but I've got, um, uh, you know, co-immunoprecipitation evidence and functional complementation evidence, which are two very different kinds of evidence um, that both say it's pathogenic. And so that actually can kind of work together to say, okay, those two very different types of evidence might be more um, corroborative that it's pathogenic versus really all very similar types of evidence over there on the right saying that it's, it's benign. You can also ask the question, well, did the same lab do the same assays or did it come from different labs? Um, which would also corroborate uh, those types of findings. Okay, so moving on a little bit to the problem of evidence for a disease. So um, this is an actual um, table that shows uh, an actual use case that shows um, the uh, evidence in a, of equivalency between these 11 different records from different um, uh, rare disease Mendelian database resources for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And so there's different ontologies or terminologies or resources over there on the left. Um, and they have, you know, mostly the same label, but not exactly. So, you know, mostly they say Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but there are some that have EDS in parentheses or one that's all in capital letters, which if you're a bioinformatics person, you know that any disease label that's all in caps comes from OMIM. <laughs> um, so that one's Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, comma, classic type. Um, some of them have text definitions. Some of them have synonyms, some of them quite a lot. So the NCIT, the National Cancer Institute source, has 26 different synonyms for Ehlers-Danlos. How can we have so many synonyms for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome in NCIT, um, but not have any synonyms for it in Orphanet, which is a, a major rare disease resource? Um, if you look at the mapping, so um, I was saying earlier that I, I have one recurring nightmare, and it's about mapping. Um, Never use anybody else's mapping. So these are outgoing mappings. So from each um, one of these terminologies, each one maps to the other. So it's this giant mess of everybody mapping to everybody else. And most of the time, these mappings are not well documented. They're just um, a, a link um, at best, uh, just an identifier tag. Um, and so you don't know who did it or why they did it or when they did it. Um, but you can see that there's this kind of smattering um, of them. Um, you know, you, we have uh, eight mappings in total between the disease ontology and the various other outgoing mappings. We have 11 um, from the Mondo ontology, which is the one that, that we've developed that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and almost all of these resources don't actually have um, phenotypic information. So you can't actually use the phenotype data that might be associated with that disease to actually decide whether or not it's the same disease or not. You really have to go on the label, and if you're lucky, there's a text definition or the synonyms that exist. And then if you look at the um, unique ones, um, uh, we come up with, a, with uh, 20 distinct mappings um, across this different suite. So what are we going to do with this mess? If you're, if you're a patient and your, your clinic uses OMIM, but not Orphanet, or MedGen, but not SNOMED, or um, NCIT, because you're more of a cancer uh, patient, you know, you're going to come up with different results as to whether or not this is a candidate disease for you. So we needed to harmonize all of this mess in order to have our diagnostic pipeline give us adequate uh, results for the clinicians to review for the candidate variants. So we needed disease categories that span multiple um, uh, disease uh, classes that span multiple categories. So a disease can be both a cardiovascular disease as well as a cancer. Um, you know, you can. We need that multiple classification that um, so many of our clinical terminologies don't give us. And we need a systematic way of relating these concepts uh, to one another. 
So um, standards proliferation, here we go. How do we know we need a new standard? Um, and <laughs> this is a great um, XKCD comic. So there's 14 competing standards. 14, that's ridiculous. We need, an, we need to develop one universal standard that covers everyone else's use cases. Yeah. Um, so the situation is soon there are 15 competing um, standards. And of course, you know, the AC chargers, character encoding, messaging, it goes on, right? Uh, but here's our situation. For diseases, there are 15 times 14, which equals 210 sets of mappings. So we already have 210 standards. So we made a new one. So um, this is, um, uh, for those um, bioinformatics folks, um, I maybe forgot to put the link on here, but this is a really neat algorithm called KBOOM, which is the Bayesian Owl Ontology Merging algorithm, which uses both logical and probabilistic inference to understand when are terms in two different terminologies, or in all the terminologies, equivalent or not? What is the evidence of their equivalence? Um, and that algorithm basically looks for the most parsimonious equivalence cliques amongst all the different ones. So if we go back to the Ehlers-Danlos example, um, here it can, it can look at all these different terms and the different ontologies and say which ones of these are actually truly equivalent versus which ones might be children classes or sibling classes um, based upon a variety of features which might include um, those mappings and cross-references, um, synonyms, placement in the graph, text definitions, priors because we like some terminologies better than others, um, and these sorts of things that can all kind of work together. And then the algorithm spits out um, uh, these equivalence cliques that we then look at the ones that have low probability and curate them and figure out what's going on. And in many cases, what we found is that they're mostly errors somewhere upstream in one of the sources. So, for example, we found in MeSH that there were a lot of terms that had um, that were essentially the same, but were in two parts of the graph where one used Roman numerals and the other used alphanumeric numerals for the, for the terms, right? But they were otherwise the same term. And so the algorithm told us, you know, this is not parsimonious. These must be um, equivalent, but you're telling me that they're two different terms. And so how do we reconcile that? So then we fed all that information back to Mesh, and it's all been fixed. Um, so it's also really helping improve upstream resources as well. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, how, um, so, if you are interested in disease um, modeling, uh, we have a new new kind of community effort on this project that aims to help define the disease models um, as well as their text and logical definitions um, as a community effort and hopefully get all these other resources, even if they keep their own terminologies, to align with this process in a community-oriented way. It'll be a long haul, but it'll be worth it. But I did want to spend just a, a little bit of time talking about the relationship between terminologies and data models, because um, especially for folks just starting off in bioinformatics, it's really important to understand how these two things relate. And we don't have um, too much time to talk about um, data models today, but it's really important to think about how um, we use these two together. So if we think about patient encounters, um, we generate a bunch of data. Um, that data goes into clinical databases. That those uh, subsets of that information can go into registries. Um, we have various kinds of inference that that give us medical knowledge um, that helps clinical decision makers um, develop clinical guidelines and manage that knowledge and feed that knowledge to clinicians as they're doing going about their work. And those clinical guidelines then feed into expert um, decision support systems um, within our EHRs and clinical settings. Um, which then leads to better um, patient care in our patient encounters. And the terminologies and the data models really have to work together at all steps in this process. So the terminologies are really the vocabulary that we use to describe these features. So for phenotypes, it's the symptoms and features. Um, but the models are the structure, the content, the, the context. So if we, will, if we say Ehlers-Danlos, we might mean that the patient was diagnosed on X date with Ehlers-Danlos, or we might mean that the patient's mother was, had Ehlers-Danlos. Um, and so we need to be able to distinguish between those two contexts. And that's where the modeling comes in. We really have to have the terminologies are useless without a model in which to place them. It's all about how they're used in context. Our HPO ontology is useless without the gold standard models for how we represent the diseases that they're associated with. And so it's really important to keep in mind that the ontology is not going to 
solve your problems all by itself, if you have a terminology problem, you really have to have a robust model that goes along with that for the computability and to support this sort of um, cycle of evidence-based practice. So I wanted to kind of follow up on the craziness of, of that and why we need a model. So this is the, re the real example and what the Mondo community is going to be working on. Different communities annotate different relationships at different levels of granularity using different vocabularies because there is no model of disease. So ClinVar annotates diseases to variants. Um, the National Cancer Institute uh, annotates diseases to genes. Um, we annotate diseases to phenotypes here in the Monarch Initiative. Um, and so, and the um, uh, uh, um, Orphanet uh, also annotates diseases to phenotypes. Um, the Comparative Toxicogenomics Database annotates diseases to treatments, and, um, and also um, the uh, um, and ClinGen uh, annotates diseases to treatments, and then CTD annotates uh, diseases to exposures. And so really what we really need is the representation of diseases that includes diseases, variants, genes, phenotypes, treatments, and exposures, right? But we can't get um, all of those from any given source. None of these many important resources that are used for clinical decision making every day share a common model. Um, so even if they use the same terminological resource, say Mondo for diseases, we're still um, out of luck because we're, we, we don't have the same model that's associating those diseases to variants. So our pathogenicity um, predictive uh, tools for helping determine the diagnosis of a patient are still going to fail because the data that we get from these resources is not aligned in terms of its model. So um, this is um, just to kind of hit that home. So we did an analysis of um, looking at um, rare diseases, uh, how to define, so we don't even define rare disease in the same in each country. So um, a rare disease in the U.S. might not be a rare disease in the U.S. And of course, there's also population differences. If you, you, um, you know, um, malaria is not a, a genetic disease per se, but um, it's um, not. It's it might be rare here. It's not rare in other parts of the world. Um, so we uh, we actually there's been a number floating around for many years of around 7,500 rare diseases. Um, it was actually, uh, that number was calculated back about 20 years ago as part of the Orphan Drug Act. Um, and people haven't really updated that number for a long time. So we actually finished this, you know, preliminary pass of the alignment of all the diseases and looked at what are all the um, leaf nodes that come out. Uh, so what are all the bottom cl classes of all the ontology terms in this, in this Mondo terminology? Um, and, and actually it's interesting because, um, uh, when we look at this, um, we actually, there's a lot of sources that, that have a lot of non-overlapping content, actually. Um, and so we end up with um, 10,500 rare disease concepts rather than 7,500, which is a huge difference. Um, and so this diagram just shows kind of the, you know, what's unique to each one. So you can see here that um, Orphanet um, has a lot of unique content, um, but then, so the way this, um, these plots work is that um, the dots show the sources, the number shows the number of terms that are found in both of those sources. So here in um, NCIT and the disease ontology, we have 704 shared concepts between those terminologies. So it's an interesting way of looking um, at the spectrum across all the different resources. Um, and so we actually just wrote a little paper about this and, um, you know, it's, in, it's it, you know, it, it might seem like a, a bit trivial and maybe we're just splitting hairs, but it actually matters for treatment. So um, for treatment and also for drug discovery, if we can't actually um, have a shared model and have a shared label, um, we, we aren't doing a very good job of building various drug discovery platforms to, um, to actually identify the right treatments. And these are patients worldwide that you know, are really desperate for, for identifying treatments. So anything we can do to help is, is really critical. Um, so just to kind of uh, speak to those who are more um, clinical informatics in the audience, so, okay. Yep, all right, I'm just about at the end here. Let's see. Um, you know what, maybe I'll, just, uh, maybe I'll just end with this slide. So this, um, this basically is sort of suggesting that, you know, we don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We have a lot of different clinical terminologies that are useful and well-established. 
uh, well regarded in our clinical systems, but we can actually anchor them with some of these more robust ontological frameworks um, and disease definitions outside the context of those terminologies. Um, and we've been thinking about how to do this using the FAST healthcare interoperability resource um, uh, to help support that. Um, and we have, uh, for those who are, are interested, we have a new standard um, to try to, you know, so we have all these ways of encoding genes, of encoding phenotypes, um, but we don't really, and we have lots of exchange formats for um, sequence information like BCF files or even FASTA files, but we've never really had a phenotypic, uh, a way of exchanging phenotypic information, um, so those profiles that I talked about. And so this really aims to help um, define uh, better ways of representing disease phenotypes for exchange at a case level for patients. So this is work in the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, and the new um, standard is called uh, phenopackets. So I'm just going to skip through all of this and go to the end, even though um, it's all very fun in there. Um, so just kind of putting things all together, this is um, essentially, um, when we think about disease models, we have to really move beyond, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the notion of um, you know, using only genetic information or only even clinical phenotypic information, but all those other kinds of expression data, um, environmental exposure data, treatment data, treatment progression, and these kinds of things. And so we've been working as part of both the Monarch Initiative and a project called the NCATS Translator to build knowledge graphs that really bring together all these different knowledge sources which have different types of data together um, using a standard framework called the BioLink model, which tells us what kinds of entities are there in the world and what kind of relationships do they have to each other. So that precision classification, those relationship bits that I showed at the beginning, um, really trying to put those together into one framework that allows um, various kinds of computational algorithms to run over these graphs and actually identify um, candidate treatments um, for drug repurposing, for example. And so here's an example for um, Fanconi anemia, where we're trying to find um, candidate drugs uh, for Fanconi anemia patients who are rather underserved in terms of therapeutics. Thanks. So um, I want to thank very many people, but especially um, my partners in crime, uh, Chris Mungle uh, and Peter Robinson, who co-lead the Monarch Initiative with me, um, and also Julia McMurray, who um, really uh, helps envision all of the research uh, together with me in our group. So thanks very much. Oh, and our funding. Thank you. It's a very nice talk. It's really amazing how well this works because there's so much bad information in medical records. <laughs> I mean, a lot of it is wrong. It's commonly incomplete. You always have environmental exposures, but we know almost nothing about environmental exposures affecting expression of disease. How does it work so well? It, well, we do it outside the EHR. I mean, most of this work is done outside the EHR. So, you know, really, you know, it takes about a day, actually, to go through um, the combination of all of the path reports, um, all the laboratory assays, EHR data, um, patient reports, um, uh, imaging data to create these phenotypic profiles for a patient to be able to run these types of algorithms. So that's one of the challenges that we have. And there's been um, some different, so I, one of the things I didn't have time to talk about is actually, um, I can actually show you really quickly. Um, is we actually translated the HPO into layperson so that patients can self-phenotype themselves to hopefully reduce the burden of the clinician in capturing this information. Um, and also because um, patients uh, sometimes have phenotypes that are not well captured clinically. So for example, we had one case um, where a baby had no tears. So that if the baby's not crying in the, in the clinic, you're not gonna notice that the baby has no tears or a baby that's inconsolable if, you know, um, these kinds of, uh, uh, or snoring, these types of phenotypes are, are capturable by the patient. So we really envision the way that this needs to work as a partnership between the patient and the clinician doing the phenotyping. So we've been doing a, a PCORI study to try to evaluate the use of this layperson version uh, in patients. 
And then um, uh, the next step would be to see how well um, that works for the clinical diagnostic uh, use case. But so that's one thing. I, I do have some colleagues that are also uh, working on some uh, uh, sort of audio recording versions uh, that would encode uh, um, verbal descriptions into phenotypic ter ontology terms uh, to help support this capture and help make that more efficient. Um, we have a variety of text mining tools that also run over the clinical records um, that then have tools that will help validate, that the clinician would validate and say, yes, yes, no, no, this is not a term. This is, you know, um, just trying to find ways to expedite uh, the capture of these, these robust phenotypic um, profiles. And then also um, working, uh, we just got funding to work with uh, HL7 to uh, build a new resource for FHIR that would be this phenotype profile which is a pheno packet, so that when the clinician goes to the trouble of creating all this content outside the EHR, they can actually put it back in so that we can start to um, have more of a, a full circle to get this information out of the EHR, improve it, get the profile that we need for computational use, and then put that back into the EHR. Yes, I have been in contact with them. Um, yeah, they, uh, they're very interested in this technology. Originally, um, they were less interested because they didn't have as, you know, there was not a business use case for rare disease. Um, but they've also found that this technology would be very useful just for creating um, communities of, of interest. So there's a lot of uh, community development in patients like me. Um, and so, um, and they're also really interested in this layperson version of, of this terminology. So, yeah, we've had some really nice conversations. They haven't done anything yet, but yeah. So that was a lot of answers. <laughs> yeah. Yes, they did. Yeah, I, thank you for all. I'm just curious if you talking to So, because what we're hearing from you today is really quite Very limited to a few data. Commit that on a That's a good question. I, I haven't had that conversation with anybody. Um, I but. Talked to you. Uh, here, but literally months. Yeah. 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 Well, and this is, yeah, and it's, it's, there's a couple real challenges there. For one is that just because it's, you know, publicly funded or larger doesn't mean it's better um, or, or good in the way that you think it is. Um, and so, for example, for ClinVar, which is a wonderful resource, um, it's used by very many people, but everybody who works on ClinVar data knows how to clean the data for use in applications, right? And so for if you have a commercial entity who's maybe less familiar with some of those data challenges, um, you know, how do you, how do you make sure? So just because it's ClinVar does not make the application that's built on top of it good, right? Um, and so we, one of the challenges that we really have in our community in general is feeding those data fixes back. So I can get, I can tell you that there are literally tens of thousands of people who have written the same scripts to clean that data from ClinVar or OMIM or many of these resources, but we don't have any way of putting those back in the hands of, of, of for the next person, right? And, and you know, we try to be good citizens and give feedback, but maybe our solutions aren't necessarily needed by all, they're only needed by some, and so that, you know, it's just challenging. Um, you know, I think that the other thing is, is um, you know, when we think we're very U.S. centric here in the U.S. <laughs> and uh, um, you know, when I when I, I I when I go to other countries and really work on the rare disease um, aspects in other countries, you know, um, they've got their resources that have their variants, right? And um, and especially for um, you know underserved communities, uh, the variants just simply aren't common variants. Just simply aren't in the public 
repositories. And so, you know, we end up um, really uh, more highly prioritizing variants that, that really shouldn't be. And so there's a kind of a global effort right now to try to improve that, which is actually going pretty well. So I don't know if it'll end up in ClinVar, but there's many other places that need to be part of that story. So, yeah. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm just wondering about how you keep these ontologies up to date with current medical knowledge. So obviously, as time progresses, um, paradigms in medicine shift. So how do you keep the uh, these huge ontologies up to date with the latest um, ways of thinking in the uh, medical community? And uh, maybe with phenotypes that we haven't noticed before, how do you um, manage that new information? That's a really good question, and it is a big challenge. Um, you know, we we should have, but don't really have uh, good tools for kind of literature reporting that, um, you know, we can sort of get automated feeds to look at certain content that needs to be added. I um, mean, it's hard because you're looking for content that you don't know about yet, right? Um, and you can't read every paper that comes out. Um, we also rely uh, really heavily on our community. So um, people who note that things are missing request things, and we add them, and we have a pretty good turnaround time. That's actually a pretty good way of, of staying current. We also have a lot of workshops with communities that you know, have emerging needs, and so we'll add a lot of content in those contexts as well. I think the bigger challenge isn't so much phenotypes, because even though we get new kinds of phenotypes, like um, you know, more molecular phenotypes, we're not really in the business of capturing those types of phenotypes. In the ontologies, that's more of a data-driven um, type of approach. Um, bye, nice to see you. Thank you. Bye. Um, but, you know, rather the actual models, so the models of diseases are what really change. And, you know, well, you know, last year we used to treat this disease with this drug, but this year we, we now recommend this, and here's the evidence for why. That kind of knowledge encoding into the disease models is, is really hard to keep up to date. And we, we haven't really addressed it yet in Mondo because we're still in the business of reconciling even the basic uh, features of each disease. Um, and especially for rare diseases, there's no, uh, we actually are working on a medical intervention ontology to associate interventions because many of the interventions are not even necessarily drugs, well, they can be, uh, but also like dietary interventions or other behavioral interventions. Um, so, you know, there's no, there's actually no good resource right now that even says what treatments we should be using at any given time for disease. So there's a lot of work to do on that part. And I think that's where the bigger challenge of keeping medical knowledge up to date is going to be a challenge. I think of some of these ontologies are really like the atomic elements that can be used in these bigger models. And it's the models and how things are put together that, that really suffer from um, decay. So, yeah. I also want to say, like, there is a wonderful thing for the review article uh, that uh, uh, was, uh, was uh, um, prepared or written by Melissa and uh, Chris Schun and uh, Peter Robinson uh, last year, just a few months ago, well, last year, yeah, uh, in the New England uh, Journal of Medicine. So it's one of the people, uh, definitely like a person, I guess, everyone. The title of the paper is Classification Oncology in the Situation Medicine. I think it's a wonderful paper. We can introduce the oncology to lay people and, uh, and how it can basically come quickly and uh, make some uh, inference. So as we know, like the gene oncology was, was published in 2000, and now it has been cited as a single paper has been cited for probably more than 30,000 times. And then people are wondering, oh, wow, this is so beautiful. And now hundreds of oncologists are coming. But, uh, so we're trying to put together the community effort to get the overall funding community and some bigger, more influential oncologists like the Mondo. And so we are actually coming together really quickly and uh, in the community effort and how it can be used. So like uh, Marisa has been wonderful uh, examples of how it can be further used. And I think maybe there will be more and more applications going on. Thanks, Oliver. Okay. Great. Thank you very much.